After we won the election, Connor refused. Connor and his group refused to leave office, right. and uh, the city commission had actually announced a week or so before the new governor was sworn in that they weren't going to leave office, <laughs> and that gave King's people a chance to. And I remember I was on a program with Wyatt T. Walker, and he said we talked about it, and, and there was a lot of pressure on us. To, to wait and let the new government have a chance to deal with this. The president, the attorney general, uh, a, a committee of black ministers. I heard Andrew Young say, I said, why do you want to go to Birmingham? He said, even the black preachers don't want you to come to Birmingham. And of course, there was a problem. You know, the black political people had worked their fingers to the bone to change the city government, to elect a new government, and I sat in on some of Bowell's meetings with them, and Bowell had made some pretty surprising, to me, commitments to them. Like what, for instance? About black that? police officers and mm -hmm. other things. Mm -hmm. I and mean, I don't remember the details, but mm -hmm. they felt they had chips on the table and that King was going to come here and, and pick up their chips and claim credit for them. That's, some of them felt that way, I think. Uh, who were these leaders that you... Uh, well, I'm talking about the, the black political leaders. Political leaders here in town. Yeah, the ones that had worked so hard to win the election. Okay. Here's somebody coming from out of town mm -hmm. to claim credit for what we've accomplished. Mm -hmm. You know, if you work on something real hard, you feel like you've got an investment in it. And, and actually, until the children started marching, the black community was really split. Mm -hmm. I remember I was talking to a black businessman. I think it was the editor of the Birmingham World, Dr. Gaston, said, uh, talking to him, and I probably talked to both of us, the truth of the matter. But I can remember, I think the editor of the Birmingham World, I was talking to him, and he was, he was very anti-King. Emory Jackson. Emory Jackson. He said, he said, you know, they say they, they don't get paid anything, all he gets is an expense account. So I was over at the motel, who I'll swap my salary for their expense account any day. You know, statements like that. But then he said, oh, your man. I said, I'm looking out my window. I said, they've turned fire hoses on children. They're rolling a little girl down the middle of the street. I can't talk to you no more. And the minute Bull thought by getting the dogs and the hoses, he'd stop it. And actually, strategically, that was the worst thing he could have done. In an instant, if there was any dissent in the black community, it disappeared. Instantly, everybody was behind him. And, uh, and the interesting thing is, you know, the sheriff over in Albany, Georgia, had pretty well defeated King. Uh, when, when King got himself arrested and he thought he, want, he wanted to be in jail and talk from the jail, the sheriff put up his bond and wouldn't, keep, wouldn't let him stay in jail. In Albany. In Albany, yeah. And when they arrested people, they sent them to jails in other towns. And, and, and the strategy was to fill our jails, and Connor just cooperated with uh, White T. Walker said, this will be our last chance to march against Bull Connor. And they knew him so well, they knew how he would react. And, and he, I always tell people, the hoses and the dogs, <laughs> that was Bull Connor's show, that was not our show. That, Connor did not speak for Birmingham at that point. He'd been rejected by the voters three times in the previous six months. The circuit court of Jefferson County held he was no longer legally an official of the city, and he was there only by virtue of an appeal pending in the Alabama Supreme Court. Wyatt Walker obviously does suggest that Bull Connor was the best thing that ever happened oh, as sure. far as the movement was concerned. Well, if you go back, the thing that really made, persuaded the business community that Birmingham had to change, they had to find a way, using all the skills and pressure and power they had to make change, because of what Bull Connor did with respect to the Freedom Rider. Uh, and, and it's interesting that, you know, back in the, tw in, tw in the 20s, we had the largest Ku Klux Klan in Birmingham of any place in the United States. But the Birmingham business community did not support the Klan. The, the newspapers did not support the Klan. And by 1932, the Klan was pretty well dead in this county. How did the Klan get to be so um, so important? Because it, at that time, it, appealed, it was well, it was yeah, it, it was basically 
a fact that a person who's running for office, if they were not supportive of the Klan, they couldn't get elected. Is that true in the 1920s? I'm told that, and I, and I asked Justice Black about joining the Klan. He said, well, I joined every organization that had members of the jury. I tried jury cases. Uh, and, it, and I think that's probably true. You know, they changed the form of city government in 1911 from a married council to a commission, and the commissioners weren't elected. They were all appointed by the governor. Uh, the first act of that new county commission, new city commission, was to appoint Hugo L. Black, recorder's court judge of the city of Birmingham. And I'm told that he refused to put black people in jail for gambling until they started arresting the white people at the country club for gambling. He said it's not right to treat one one way and the other. The only case he ever took to the Birmingham, to the Alabama, to the U.S. Supreme Court was the Lewis case. Lewis was a black convict leased to a mining company. He had an accident, broke his back, or some serious injury. A black represented him and got a judgment against the mining company. And the mining company filed bankruptcy to, to avoid paying the black man his money. And uh, black took it to court. And he lost. He lost in the Alabama Supreme Court. But he took his case to the out, out to the informal apocryphus to the United States Supreme Court, and he personally took it. He got on the train and personally took his papers. And when he got to the Supreme Court, at that time the Supreme Court actually didn't have a building. It had a they heard its cases on the first floor of the Capitol building. If you go there today, they'll show you the old Supreme Court building. And the justices had their offices at home, but the clerk there was a clerk's office. The clerk refused to accept the judge's petition for certiorari. And the judge said, well, it's in the rules that a, a pauper can bring his case. He said, yeah, but we don't take those. If we ever started taking informal pauperous cases, we'd be flooded. And Black said, well, I want to speak to Justice Sanford, who was the judge assigned to the Fifth Circuit. And uh, he said, he really said, said, just as it says here in the rules, I can file this paper. But the marshal, or the, the clerk will not accept it. He says they just, it's a policy not to accept informal policy cases. And Justice Sanford called the clerk in and ordered him to allow Justice uh, Hugo Black to file his case. And he won his case. Reversed it and, and Lewis got his, ultimately got his money. Oh. Uh, But I think those things spoke for the judge. And I, I really take him at his word when he says, I joined every other side. Because, frankly, I don't think, so you don't think, that the I don't think he would have been elected senator without support of the Klan. Mm -hmm. So the Klan was, in fact, a very powerful. Very man. powerful. But between the 26th election and the 1932 election, the Klan had virtually disappeared from Alabama politics. If they uh, were not supported by the politicians nor by the business, who supported them? How, how did they get to be so powerful? Well, they made, I, you know, it's, it's a lot of times people get too big for their britches. And they would go into churches and make donations and make a big to-do of it. Uh, and again, I don't think the politicians supported the Klan. I think it, you're looking at democratic government again. The great strength of democratic government. There's also the weakness that the public is somewhat fickle. It can change its mind quickly from one year to the next. And that's why we have a Bill of Rights mm -hmm. to protect people against those changes. And no matter that government simply some things it just can't do to protect the individual freedom. And that's what the Fourteenth Amendment ultimately did to protect the blacks, people of this country. But it, it took it a hundred years because. In 1901, there was enough racial prejudice on the Supreme Court itself. You know, the Supreme Court owed it to correct that mistake because it made the mistake. But if you look back in some of the histories like C. Van Woodward's books on that period, uh, immediately prior to 1901, the Populist Party was a biracial party. 
It had black candidates and white candidates. But the minute they took the vote away from the blacks, the Populist Party virtually became the party of the Klan. Absolutely. Because that's where the support was. A lot of people think Cobb was elected governor of Alabama on the populist ticket and it was stolen from him. Of course, black came from Clay County, which was a heavy populist area. And populism left an imprint on Alabama that practically every successful office holder for many years was basically a populist. Now, as a populist, he could be liberal or he could be conservative, depending on what the issue was. And people looked at these people as being very different. But really, you know, Lister Hill, John Sparkman, George Wallace, Hugo Black, Bib Graves, they all came out of the same basic political uh, ideology. Some stressed one thing, some another. Of course, ultimately, ultimately, George Wallace met with the black leaders and said, look, I did the wrong thing. I made a mistake. I shouldn't have done it. And being good Christians, the black voters accepted his apology and forgave him when we had a chance to get a bright young, a bright young new, lo and behold, Wallace, the smart politician, figured out how to get a large part of the black vote and overcome Macmillan. Yeah. You know, the David. Throughout the history of, of black people in this country, there seemed to be uh, instances where seemingly what was good for black people were not good for the country, and vice versa, was good for the country. Let me just ask you, what, in fact, would have happened in Birmingham if Bull Connor had not done what he did? Well, let me say, at the time, I sincerely believed that we had pulled off a political miracle, that we had proved that the, the democratic structure can successfully make changes. And of course, I had won a victory that, you know, people just said, there's no way you can beat Bull Connor, but we did. Uh, partly he beat himself, he did a lot of ridiculous things. Uh, what, the, the point I'm raising, what, what would that have done for race relations in this city? Would they have been uh, any different would there have been changes made? Either? Well, I think, let me say this. I think that, that election had strange results. I think we had a decade of black and white working together in unprecedented ways. In fact, the city was recognized as an all-American city because of the, the level of cooperation. One of the first things the city can't did when the, uh, when it took power in July of 63, it repealed every segregation law in the books in the city of Birmingham in one city. Uh, and that was essential because we'd made agreements unsigned. You know, I see a lot of historians say that this was signed on such and such a day that the settlement, the, the racial settlements in 63 was never signed by anybody. Uh, it was announced by Smyre and by King. And it required the desegregation of lunch counters, the removal of the racial signs from elevators and restrooms and drinking fountains and all those things. Uh, required a, a, a beginning of an employment program to hire black clerks in downtown stores. All those things were illegal under the laws of the city of Birmingham. Uh, and, and Bull Connor had hired every policeman. The new government had to, had a police department, all of whom were hired by Bull Connor. Uh, and it was essential that before we began, we had a 60 day cooling off period. But when that 60 days was over and the time came we had to start actually doing those things, we had to have those laws off the books or it's hard to, to blame a policeman for not enforcing a law that's on the books, you know. So we had to get those off. And the new mayor and council had the guts to do it. And we created about 11, 11 biracial committees on every subject you can imagine, taxation, recreation, schools. I think we call our school committee the committee to support the school board. 
And Connor had appointed all members of the school board. And the law firm that represented him represented the school board. So we had to go into, into the desegregation of schools. And I say Reed Barnes was a lawyer from that firm. No lawyer ever performed a professional service any better than Reed Barnes. A lot of people are unaware. But there was never a hearing on school desegregation in Birmingham. It was done by agreement from the very first day until this day. There's never been a hearing, I don't think, because the, the, the NAACP lawyers and the and lawyers of the school board have been able to work, uh, work out the various steps along the way. The first, the first desegregation was uh, in September of 63. This new government hadn't been in office but two months. It handled the most emotional thing uh, you know, uh, but there were also marches even after the governor, new government yes, came in yes, because yes, there, there were, were different interpretations of oh, what yes. those agreements. Were. Oh yes, as a matter of fact, uh, some of the ACHMR people tried to start them over again about ten days afterward, mm -hmm. and uh, they put up, they put out handbills in the yeah. schools, and I called Andrew Young and I said, these break our agreement. And Andy got on an airplane, came over, sat down. He looked at him, he said, you're right, it, it breaks the agreement. He gets on the phone, he calls Dr. King. He says, this is wrong. We agreed to do something, and now there are people not want to honor the agreement. King himself came. He got here about 2 o'clock in the afternoon that day. And they got a group of the high school leaders over at the Gaston Motel. I was not there, but I saw it on television. And King said to them, he said, look, we've made this progress to open the doors of opportunity to you. And I want you to go back to school, learn your lesson, prepare yourself for the opportunities that lay ahead of you. Well, they weren't too enthusiastic. That sounded good, but they were young people, and they thought marching was sort of funny. If you look at the pictures of the hosing, they're black kids dancing in the hosey. I mean, it's obviously a, um, you're not going to have any standing in your, among your peers unless you get arrested. Or, you know, I mean. But there it, were also disagreements between Smy and Shuttlesworth in terms of how oh, yes. they interpreted oh, the yes, agreement. Oh, yes, yes. Smy said that there was Fred, one Fred did person. Not, Fred did not want it to stop. But by the same token, Fred was raising a, a, a very serious question. He said, this is, this is what the, the agreement, the, the disagreement was over how many people, how many blacks would be hired in stores. Smyer has suggested that one person would be hired in one store. Fred was saying that the agreement was to have at least one person in every store. Look, there's no doubt. I, you know, as they say, the agreement was never signed. Right. It was read by both. But if you look at what King said, we would start a program of employment and we would start with at least three clerks in downtown stores. I'll be honest with you, I had a commitment from five stores to put on a black clerk. But I said when, come, when the push comes to shove, and when they start breaking the windows of the stores, some of those folks are going to back out. And so I only gave three. I promised three. Dr. King knew that. Now, Shuttlesworth wasn't there. But he had a, I understand he had a press conference in New York and somebody said, you mean you set up for three? Well, I meant three in every store. Well, once Fred commits himself to something, he's going to follow it down the line, and he did. But King came back and stopped him, and the children did not march again. They took King at his word, and I've always thought it was very important that the last speech that King made in Birmingham as a part of this episode in his life was a speech to the school children of Birmingham saying, we're opening opportunities for you. You need to apply yourself. You need to get ready because you're going to have better opportunities than any of the people that, of our race that proceed. And I say, I saw that on television. Is where that tape exists anymore or not? I do not know. Well, obviously, those were some very turbulent days, and it was a, a period, a turning point in the history of Birmingham. I think it was a turning point in the history of America. A group of businessmen went and met with Kennedy. They had a 15-minute appointment, but he kept them two and a half hours. 
And I believe up until that day, the Kennedys thought this was too hot an issue to raise until after the next election. But when, those, when he saw that Birmingham had made a voluntary agreement between his business community and his black community, and it had, and had the guts to carry it out, and it wasn't easy. Parisians had every, every ounce of glass in Parisian store was broken that night. Emil Hess, bless his heart, he called every glass company in the county. By the time the sun came up, every window was intact. There was no broken glass. Whoever, whoever did it came back to admire his work. I said, God, was I in another city or something? Uh, there were people, like the night Dr. King was assassinated. I got a call very shortly after from a black businessman. He said, we've got to go to work. We can't let the sun rise on this. And we got phone calls in both the black and white communities going all over this city during that five-hour period. By the time the sun rose, we were able to announce a memorial march from 16th Street Baptist Church with special services in honor of Dr. King on the, ba on the steps of the courthouse. And the leader of every denomination in this city, black and white, met at 16th Street Baptist Church, and they had a memorial march in honor of Dr. King and a service at the courthouse. And this was virtually the only major city in the United States where no buildings were burned, no, no uh, uh, riots were held. And you know what was happening in Detroit. They had to send two airborne divisions into, Chicago, into Detroit to stop the, the protest. And, you know, and it, you say, well, silly, why do they burn down their own houses? Well, people in emotional states do a lot of things that are illogical, you know. Uh, but Birmingham, we had black and white people that kept that from blowing the top off. And it could have. Probably, I'd have to have very few cities in the United States where Dr. King was held in greater esteem by, by the black community. Uh, and those things don't happen by accident. 